Hey, it's Justin with Seaboard Marine. We're here today to talk about alternators. Now I'm going to put a table of contents up on the board so you can see what we're going to talk about and jump ahead to whatever topic you need, or you can stick around for the whole video. First thing we're going to talk about is selecting an alternator uh, the right frame size so that it fits in your engine. Now we sell a wide range of alternators on our website, ranging anywhere from the K1 all the way up to the uh, 28SI. Um, a lot of the alternators have similar frame sizes. So this is a 15SI alternator here. And the 15SI is the same, has the same pivot and bolt spacing as the 19SI. So this is our 19SI alternator. Um, the K1 is gonna be very similar here, except it's a, it's a shorter distance to the tensioning uh, bolt hole. So you might need, you can actually go from a K1 up to a 15SI or a 19SI um, if you have the, the physical space for the larger 19SI, but you may have to make a different bracket to tension the belt and get the belt, uh, the pulley in the right position. The 15SI typically has this uh, stamped steel fan blade where the 19SI has uh, the cast blade. So the 22SI um, can have the stamp blade look looks kind of similar, but you'll notice that the, the mounting bracket is quite different. So the 22SI, the 24SI, and the bigger 28SI, which is, looks very similar to this, all have about a four inch uh, mounting pivot. So they're the, and the pivot goes inside of the wings of the alternator. There's a four inch mounting pivot like that. The smaller alternators like the 15 and the 19SI have about a two inch, I think it's a little under two inch mounting pivot and, and the alternator goes inside the, the pivot wings on the engine bracket. So once you figured out what kind of frame style you have, figure out what alternator will fit in your engine, then we need to determine what uh, wiring you have. Basically, we sell the alternators in two different configurations, and that is a three wire or a one wire alternator. The three wire alternator has multiple wires. It'll probably have a plug. In most applications, it'll have a plug on the alternator of some type something plugged into it, but also it could just have some wires connected to the back with, um, you know, ring terminals. Um, and either way, you can change from ring terminals to a plug or vice versa when you're changing alternators. It's not a big deal. There's only a few wires to connect. The one wire alternator is simple. Um, here's a good example of a one wire alternator here. Um, basically, you just need to put the charge post on the charge post. And if you have a ground wire, you can ground the alternator or they can often be grounded through the case. So a one wire alternator, you bolt it in, you hook up the battery uh, and you're off and running, pretty straightforward. But if you have a three wire alternator or you, if you're gonna reconfigure your batteries, you may need to understand how a three wire alternator works. So how a three wire alternator works is it has, not only does it have the main charge post, but a three wire alternator also has a few extra wires here. One of them is for a tachometer one of them, which, which we don't use very often in Cummins engines. One of them is for a voltage sensing wire and one of them is for an excitation wire. So we'll go over those one at a time. Obviously you still have the charging post. So you're gonna connect your charging wire here. We have on our website, some little diagrams to help you kind of identify what's what. If you look at it in this configuration, the upper right one is the tachometer signal, uh, which we, don't generally use in most uh, Cummins app mid range applications. And then you have your uh, sensing wire, and then you have your uh, field ex or excitation wire, or some people call it ignition wire. It can be field, excitation, ignition. All three of those are kind of used interchangeably. The sensing wire is really the important one. We'll talk about that first. You can install a three wire alternator in a one wire application, but you can't install a one wire alternator in a three wire application. And the way that you would install a three wire alternator in a one wire application is simply to take the voltage sensing wire, put a ring terminal on it, which we ship most of our alternators with a ring terminal on the end of the plug. And you just put that right onto the charging terminal. And now the alternator can see, quote unquote, battery voltage and it'll charge the batteries accordingly. If you need to remotely sense the battery voltage, then we can take that wire and we can run it to um, a, directly to a battery bank or to the starting to the house bank or to the starting bank uh, as needed to sense the, the appropriate battery voltage and charge the batteries accordingly. Let's talk about the field wire. What is the field wire and what does it do? So the field wire also called the ignition wire or the excitation wire. Basically what it does is it energizes the coils in the alternator to start the alternator charging. So to make 
electricity, you need to move a magnet past a wire or a wire past a magnet. The inner and outer windings are both just copper windings. There's no permanent magnets in the alternator per se. So uh, to initiate that initial magnetism needed to create a magnet moving over a wire situation or vice versa, you have to create an electromagnet and that's where the excitation wire comes into play. It puts a little bit of juice through the field windings, creating an electromagnet for the rotor to spin and then you have a magnet moving past a wire. Once an alternator has been excited once, it will generally have enough magnetism to keep producing electricity um, because there, I think some of the plates inside that hold the, the windings are steel and so they, they hold a little bit of um, uh, residual magnetism, just enough to start the process. Um, but if you get a brand new alternator, it may not work right out of the box. You may need to take the, the, the field wire and just touch it once, just, just for a second, to battery voltage. And then you start the engine and it'll run and it'll work. And the alternator will put out juice and it may work like that for the whole life of the engine. <laughs> if you have an alternator that is, is losing its residual magnetism, in other words, it won't stay producing energy, or you have to rev the engine really high to get it to start producing electricity, then you may need uh, to connect the excitation wire. And the way that we do that is through a diode. So when you turn the key on, the electricity excites the field of the alternator through a diode. The key part is the diode, when you turn the key off, it keeps the electricity from backfeeding onto the ignition circuit. Because if you don't have that diode, as soon as you turn off the key, everything will stay lit up and the engine won't shut off. So if you've recently replaced your alternator with a new alternator and your engine won't turn off when you turn off the key, it's because of something's gone wrong with that excitation wire. And you probably just need a diode and maybe, and we sell the diodes and the diode uh, pigtail socket to install those. Okay, now we're gonna talk about diode isolators. Diode isolators are something that um, are a really good idea to employ on your boat. It's basically a way to ensure that both your house bank and your starting battery charge uh, from your alternator automatically, but that your starting battery doesn't discharge um, when you are using your house bank. So in other words, you go to go steaming out to your favorite fishing grounds, um, the whole way out, it might be an hour or two, whatever, your alternator is charging both of your batteries, your house bank and your starting bank through the uh, diode isolator. When you get to anchor, you drop anchor and you turn on the radio and you and you turn on a fan or whatever, some lights, and while you're sitting there enjoying yourself for the day, the house bank is draining down, but the starting battery stays fully charged. And the diode isolator is very key for that. You can achieve this with battery switches, and a lot of people do that. A lot of people just have simple like Perco style switches, and when they're going to steam out, they combine their batteries so they both charge, and then when they get to anchor, they disconnect the starting battery um, and kind of manually control it. But that's a little risky and it also can get a little weird with the way your three wire alternator uh, senses the voltage. If you're running a diode isolator on your boat, you're going to need a three wire alternator. The three wire alternator will allow you to essentially bypass the diode isolator and read the voltage of the battery that you would want to read or base your charge on. There's always gonna be a little bit of a compromise because you have two separate batteries and there's no way to read and average without some kind of sophisticated computer, average the voltage and, and have the alternator put out the right amount of juice, but that's okay. You really just want to sense the one that's going to generally be lower because then the juice will kind of naturally flow that way anyways, because it's like water seeks its own level. It's not going to magically bring up just because the alternator is putting out a higher current. It's not going to overcharge the main battery if that current can flow through to the uh, house bank through the diode isolator. So you're still going to, um, you're still gonna have some automatic regulation there, but uh, there are some cases where people will install a switch. Tony, Tony's like famous thing is to put in two um, digital voltmeters with a switch. And so you can literally switch your alternator uh, sense wire from one battery bank to the other battery bank and you can and kind of select whichever one's lowest or whichever one you feel is appropriate um, to uh, set your charge rate at that time. Now, most diode isolators have three posts, a center post, which the charging, the charging output connects to, and then one post for each battery. Some diode isolators have a fourth post that's usually marked ignition, and that post is, has what we say a slow leak. So basically, elect electricity or voltage will leak across, 
And this allows the alternator, a one wire alternator, to actually see the voltage at the charging post. So you can connect a one wire alternator to a diode isolator if it has the ignition post. So all of our alternators that we currently sell are internally regulated alternators. They're designed to work with uh, regular flooded batteries. Um, they work okay with AGMs. Some people um, really get concerned about um, AGM batteries and whether or not these will under or overcharge an AGM. Um, for most uh, general day use and even a lot of um, commercial fishermen or people who use their boats on a fairly regular basis, um, the internally regulated standard alternator will work fine with an AGM. Now it may not give it a perfectly good topping charge. It may um, undercharge it slightly, um, but that doesn't hurt a battery. Batteries don't really get damaged unless they are sitting below like 12.4. That's when sulfation begins. So the battery won't get harmed sitting at a slightly lower voltage than full, full, full charge. But if you really want to care for your battery every so often, it should run through a full charge cycle and it should do so that with a charge cycle that's appropriate for that, that chemistry and that battery manufacturer. So if you have an AGM of one manufacturer or the other manufacturer, whatever, you should get their manufacturer recommended charging profile, program it into a good quality shore power charger. And every once in a while, when you plug into shore power, that will run your, your um, battery through a full cycle, all the way through absorption, bulk absorption and um, float and keep the battery happy. It's okay if when you go out for a trip, the alternator doesn't, doesn't do that exact um, cycle. In fact, that alternators really aren't designed to do that because they're intermittent use. You turn your engine off, you turn your engine on, you, it doesn't really know it doesn't really know where the battery is at to be able to run it through that full cycle. So some people kind of go down a rabbit hole with, these, with the battery charging a little too deep. Generally, you slap one of these in, whether you have an AGM or a flooded, and it's going to be fine. Um, if you're really concerned about longevity and health of your battery, look at a good quality shore charger that'll, that it, that'll be programmable and customizable in the profile for that specific battery that you use, whether it's flooded, AGM, or lithium. Speaking of lithium batteries, standard internally regulated alternators may or may not work with a lithium battery. You need to check with your manufacturer. Now, some lithium batteries have a sophisticated um, battery management system that can accept the output of a standard alternator, automotive or marine style alternator. And then the battery management system will handle everything basically on its own. Other lithium batteries require a very specific alternator output. So you might want to look into something like a, a, an externally regulated alternator. Um, I've made a number of mounts for people who have converted to big lithium battery banks and want to add either a secondary or just a primary um, uh, charger uh, alternator dedicated to charging their lithium batteries. And most of those people are running an externally regulated alternator. I've also heard of some products that go between the internally regulated alternator and the battery. Um, and that can work, uh, make those, make a regular alternator work with a lithium battery. Another good way to charge your lithium battery is with a DC to DC charger. This is a charger that will draw off of your existing alternator and starting battery, you know, DC circuit. And it uses that as a source to charge the lithium battery with, you know, the appropriate charging profile for that chemistry. Okay, so that's our alternator video. It got a little long, so we chopped it up into chapters. Hope that helped you navigate around, find what you need. If you watch the whole thing, thanks for watching. Um, there's a few things we could probably dive in a little deeper. So if you see something or think of something that you would like to see a little bit more on, uh, go ahead and comment below and we'll try to make some more videos and keep them coming. So thanks for watching.